The African Rhino Conservation Collaboration invites you on an exclusive trip to the Eastern Cape of South Africa, where you will stay at one of the 11 lodges and go on a safari on the award-winning Amakala Game Reserve. You will be invited behind the scenes at the Ark and you will be hosted by the world famous wildlife vet Dr. William Folds. He will teach you about the rhino and their poaching plight. You will then be taken to meet an anti-poaching unit and you will be introduced to Ella, the Eastern Cape's first cold scent tracking dog, as well as being educated about the role of fixed wing aerial patrols. You will also be taken to some of ARC's community projects, which develop socio-economic conservation solutions, as well as to educate the next generation. And the grand finale, you'll be taken on a once-in-a-lifetime experience, joining Dr. Folds on a rhino procedure, where you'll be up close and personal with these amazing animals. I'm here with Peter, Gary, Sonia and Margaret. You will then get a chance to fly inside the chopper where you will watch the rhino recover and get an aerial perspective of the reserve before carrying on with your amazing safari.
guest at Terrific Game Reserve. I would love nothing more than welcoming you to Kurika Game Reserve. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Wherever you are around the world, thank you so much for joining us for this rapid response for Rhino's very special live event. My name is Simon Jones and I'm the CEO of Helping Rhinos and I'm thrilled to be joined this evening by the world famous wildlife vet, Dr. William Folds and by the director of the Coleca Foundation, Lindy Sutherland. Both Will and Lindy are joining us live from South Africa and we'll be hearing a lot more from both of them a little later on this evening. But in the meantime, we're incredibly excited to have the opportunity to transport you, no matter where you are around the world, to the plains of Africa to stand shoulder to shoulder alongside Will and his team as they carry out an essential healthcare and dewarming procedure on a rhino called Colin. I will let Lindy explain a little later on why Colin has the name he does, but he's a very special rhino. And that's because he's the second calf born to one of the most famous rhinos in the world called Tandy. Now, unfortunately, the reason Tandy is so famous is because 
she was victim to poachers in March 2012. But miraculously, thanks to the dedication of Will and his team, and the care given by Lindy and her team at Kureka, Tandy survived and has gone on to have three calves, the second of which, Colin, we will see a lot more of this evening. The Tandy story is a constant reminder that rhinos continue to face a very real threat to their very survival on this planet. Poaching being one of the most notable, of course, but we also now have COVID-19, which is also placing a huge threat on rhinos. Not from a health perspective, as far as we're aware, rhinos can't catch COVID, uh, but from a, uh, from a implication of COVID on conservation sites like Kareka around the world, it is unprecedented. Places like Kareka rely a lot on funding from ecotourism. It's a funding that's been switched off overnight and is having dire impacts on things like anti-poaching patrols. I'm pleased to say that those patrols are continuing today, but with lack of income coming in, it puts a real threat on them moving forward. And that's why events like today are so critical. Will and Lindy and us at Helping Rhinos need your support like we've never needed it before. And that's why during the course of the evening, you'll see the link in the top of the screen, which is where you can make a donation. And I would just please urge you to donate whatever you can afford to help Lindy and Will and people like them that we work with to continue to keep rhinos safe in their natural habitat. As I said, they're relying on us now like never before. So thank you in advance for whatever you can give. We also want as many people to join us as possible this evening. So please tell all your friends that you're watching and ask them to join us too, wherever you're watching, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube. And if you are watching on Facebook, then please share this post so your friends will see it. And, and you can even start a watch party. But in the meantime, let me hand over to Lindy to explain a little more around the Kareka Game Reserve, the Kareka Foundation, and what it is we're here for this evening. from a beautiful and chilly Kareka Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Kareka is a 10,000 hectare wilderness that my father started, Colin Rashmir, more than 30 years ago. And it's one of the most inspiring conservation stories in our area with up to 25 farms knitting together slowly over time and becoming rewilded. I'm Lindy Sutherland and I'm the director of the Kareka Foundation. We work on behalf of and in partnership with Kareka Game Reserve to deliver on our mandate on what we believe sustainable and responsible tourism should be. Firstly, we focus on having a healthy and vibrant, vibrant commercial side to our business. We strive for professional, research-based, ethical conservation programs and practices. And we work collaboratively with our neighboring communities towards a collective vision of rejuvenation and upliftment for them all. We're gathering here to perform uh, and film a darting procedure on a three and a half year old rhino bull for the purpose of, track, of fitting a tracking device, checking on his overall health and concluding a dehorning procedure. We're doing this in partnership with Helping Rhinos for their Rapid Response for Rhinos initiative. We want to invite the world in to experience firsthand the measures we have to go to to protect this critically endangered species. It's also an opportunity to sound the alarm that your help is needed. This war is far from won, and the rhino species' future is far from secure. While we have made a lot of progress in protective measures, and we, we now globally run well-resourced, well-trained anti-poaching units, uh, canine units, aerial patrols, dehornings, these have all become part of, um, of global protective practice. COVID-19 has dealt rhino conservation a devastating blow. And rhino conservation globally is under enormous pressure and under enormous threat. For most of these organizations, like ourselves, we are either funded through donations or through commercial partners. In the case of Kareka Foundation, 
our anti-poaching unit is funded entirely through a conservation and community levy that is paid by every adult guest that stays at Karika Game Reserve. Now, on March 26th to 2020, Karika Game Reserve had to close our gates due to COVID-19. We are completely uncertain as to when we will reopen our gates, and so our funding has dried up. We are now entirely dependent on initiatives like Rapid Response for Rhinos, helping us raise the funds in order to keep our anti-poaching team active and in order to keep our crash of rhino protected at this time. And rhino conservation projects globally are in the same boat. So we are here with a heartfelt plea to all of you to open your hearts and to dig deep into your pockets. Through Rapid Response for Rhinos, you'll be supporting rhino conservations globally to survive, and through them, you'll be helping to protect our majestic rhinos. Thanks, Lindy. It was really nice to see some of Koreka again. Uh, I wish I was there in person. And of course, very good to hear about the work of the Koreka Foundation. Next, I'm going to hand you over to Will at the briefing. Now, the briefing takes place at the start of the day and is incredibly important as it's Will's chance to let all of the team on the ground know what their roles are for the day and uh, the risks involved with what uh, is about to happen. Now, I should say, uh, as a constant reminder, that uh, we are living in a COVID-19 pandemic, so you'll see all of the team, including Will, wearing face coverings. Uh, so they don't mean to look like bandits, but unfortunately, that's the world we're living in at the moment, and it's what's required by law in South Africa. So let me hand you over to Will and enjoy the briefing. Uh, good morning, Kareka Game Reserve team. Uh, it's good to be here. Today's an unusual event because we're also joined by uh, the Helping Rhinos Initiative um, audience from the UK and hopefully... Uh, many other countries as well as part of the rapid response for rhino uh, initiative that simon jones and his team have put together and we're going to take you along on a, a procedure that sadly we have to do uh, more and more frequently now uh, dehorning rhino because of the pressure that they're under um, for us this is probably the worst procedure that we do uh, with these animals while they are alive it's not something we enjoy doing um, it's a sacrilege to remove their horns the way we do, but uh, we do feel that we are justified in doing so, and certainly a reserve like Kericha is testament to the fact that it does work as part of a much broader holistic response to the poaching and illegal wildlife trade. So for all of you that are supporting helping rhinos in the UK um, to help us here on the ground, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for... Uh, all the support you've already given helping rhinos over the years and uh, clearly this fight is not over. Last two safety aspects. Um, number one, please don't touch the dart because of the dangerous drugs that are in there. Leave that to Candace and myself. Number two, um, the area in front of a sedated rhino is the danger zone uh, between 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock. When we're working with them, uh, we're using a fairly new combination of drugs. And the idea behind that is to have these rhinos as light as possible and aesthetically because that's the best for them physiologically. The oxygen levels are the highest, the acid levels are the lowest. Um, and, but what, it, what can happen is they, they can wake up while we're busy working with them. And if that happens normally, they will lunge forward in a fairly high stepping gait. And if they stand on your foot, you will not be able to get out the way. So just to avoid that area, please... Um, Whenever we can, Jason's going to have to work there when he does the dehorning. Um, and we will try and monitor the anesthetic and warn the team if we think we've got a wake up about to happen. If that does happen, just get behind um, and help on the, on the anchor rope. Just be mindful, we don't want too many people on that anchor rope. We don't want too much pressure there. So maximum four people on the anchor, please, until uh, we can just get things stabilized. And then we'll use a top up drug. Uh, to bring um, that rhino down to its chest again once we are happy that that circulation has returned. All right, any questions? Okay, so with the briefings done, it's time to get into the vehicles and out onto the reserve to see if we can find Colin. 
But before we do that, just a couple of quick reminders. Please don't forget the link in the top of your screen that will allow you to make a donation uh, that ensures we can help the likes of Will and Lindy continue to protect rhinos in their natural habitat. With the lack of funding coming in because of uh, no ecotourism, they need your support more than ever before. So please do continue to give whatever you can during the course of uh, the next 40 odd minutes while we're watching this procedure. And please also remember to share with your friends that you're watching and hopefully that you're enjoying it. Um, you can do that just by sharing the links to our YouTube page or if you're watching on Facebook, you can uh, share the post or you can start a watch party. What you're about to see is a procedure uh, includes some healthcare treatments and also a dehorning. And Will and Lindy will explain during the course of the film exactly why it is that Kareka dehorn their rhinos. But it's important to note from a security perspective that this dehorning of Colin was the first of several dehornings that took part that day to ensure all their rhinos had been dehorned. So without further ado, I will hand you back over to Will in the vehicle as, they, as he heads off to look for Colin. Enjoy this experience. One of the incredible privileges about working with animals in an environment like this is to be out in these um, insane habitats. Just think an amazing amount of biodiversity here. These habitats are just teeming with life and it's so important not just to look after rhino but to take care of the whole ecosystem. Because this is this biodiversity, uh, these forests, this clean air is what this world needs more of. Okay so Chris is reporting that we they might have found uh, Timby and Colum. We'll get a bit closer just to verify that, which is possibly good news because if they are the two that we've just seen, they're in a really nice place. So one of the things that we do to try and li limit the risks associated with darting by vehicle and the possibilities that these animals will, uh, when the dart goes in, it's obviously a slightly painful episode and they run away into uh, thickets like this, or even worse, over the horizon. Uh, so we are making use of uh, small consumer drones like this one and uh, this is the backup drone this is not the, the main one that's going to be flying so don't worry i'm, I'm not the pilot today um, the idea being that if it does look like the rhino are going to run away from us we put the drone up and use that to follow them the drone will not be able to steer them in any direction purely to keep eyes on them from the air so that we don't lose them critical part of this is that as soon as the rhino goes down under this anesthetic cocktail we need to get to them as quick as possible so we can begin to administer drugs and those drugs are there to try and alleviate the negative side effects of the anesthetic cocktail um, and I'll get on to more a little bit later. As we make an approach to the area that uh, we have seen Rana in, um, what's going through my head at the moment is you only get one shot when you're darting from a vehicle um, because that fright that the Rana gets takes them from a very passive, trusting situation to a, a very active, distressful situation where they start running away. Uh, and the critical thing here is. The, the dart placement has to be done really well. So this is the kind of dart that we'll be using today. Two and a half inch needle to penetrate through a really thick skin. And one of the dangers is that uh, if this needle doesn't penetrate perfectly through the skin so that the tip of the needle injects the drug into a muscle, then that animal, the effects of the drug will either be delayed or even worse if the needle blocks the needle bends, if the needle breaks off, which can happen, the drug won't be released into the rhino and they will then run away uh, and not fall over. And that could pose a serious danger for them because we don't know in the case of a blocked needle if it might unblock several hours later and we may not be there to look after that animal. So I'm always a little bit anxious, um, 
that things can go wrong here and uh, so we will try and be as careful as we can obviously we'll take our time over this we'll try and make sure that the dart, dart placement is as good as possible but there are a number of things that can go wrong in the process and uh, that always just makes the butterflies flutter as we approach um, to do these things because uh, there's so much out of our hands and so many unforeseen things that could happen as we go along right so we're just about onto the plains now uh, and this is the kind of space that we want to work with them in it's nice and open uh, we've got people on high points watching over this area so hopefully when the darting is done wherever the runner may run we'll be able to watch them either from our position here or from the drone or from the high points one or two weeks when Andy was hanging out in this water course. Eh? Yeah. I think the first photograph I had of it. Uh, this one. Okay, so this is Tundi here that we're just about to make an approach of. Um, yeah, this is a this is a valley that is it brings back uh, incredibly difficult memories just for me and I, and I only came here every now and again to do the treatments on Tandy but uh, Jason and his team were involved with it 24 7 down here and what it often well what strikes me every time about being here is this incredible contrast between this magnificent landscape and the beauty that is here and then the pain and suffering that this animal endured in this very place uh, and just how Humanity sometimes breaks into these perfect worlds and creates so much havoc and it's something that stayed with me since 2012. And I'll never forget the gut-wrenching emotions that we went through being part of our lives um, just on the, on the veterinary team. So I can't imagine what Jason and, and his team went through when they were busy looking after her and watching over her and not knowing whether she'd make it through the next day. Beautiful girl. Yeah, in spite of that scarring that's there, she is so special, this lady. And all that she represents. Okay, just gonna have a look there. <coughs> the beautiful giraffe here. Okay, so we're just making a, a very slow approach. Um, this crash of four are now sleeping on the road. Don't tell me why, because it looks damn uncomfortable <laughs> compared to the nice soft grass here. Um, maybe they're trying to camouflage themselves with a the grey background. But they're having a beautiful snooze, so we just want to get close enough to identify who's who here. Yeah? And then from there we will come up with a plan on what we're going to do first. Daniel, can you hear me? Okay, sounds like this other vehicle has picked up Colin and he is just sneaking out of the bush line behind us, which is great news. He's coming to join his friends. Okay. Awesome. So what I'm going to do in the meantime is just make up a dart. Um, so just to talk you through the ingredients of this dart, uh, there are three components we're going to mix in here. Um, first and foremost, the, the deadly drug, which is uh, very dangerous for humans, is an opioid drug. This is has got a, a potency at least a thousand times stronger than morphine. So we are very careful when we work with this drug. It's the one that gets the runner to stop running and to fall over. So we call this the knockdown drug. However, runner are very, very sensitive to this drug, as are humans. And uh, as soon as it starts to have that effect on them, what it does is suppress their respiratory center and it uh, suppresses their cardiovascular system. 
So these animals actually, by the time we get to them, they are severely physiologically compromised. Their blood oxygen levels are way down. We measure 40 or 50 percent, and we've got a machine here today to help us with that. Um, and unless we give them some drugs to lighten that anesthetic, they will remain at, at extremely low oxygen levels, so low that we actually don't even know how they survive that. But um, important to get those oxygen levels up. So that's the main focus of the anesthetic after we get to them is to, is to start pulling back on this drug so that their hearts beat better, their circulation is better, they're exchanging more, more oxygen and they're using less oxygen at the tissue level, at the, at the muscular level. Action. Right, so to that we're going to add a tranquilizer called Stressnel. Uh, it's called a Zaparone. Uh, this is a, to help alleviate some of the blood pressure issues and then also complements the action of the opioid so that we don't have to use as much opioid as we would have otherwise. And then uh, Candace has got uh, another drug called Hyalase sitting in the, in the cool box. So we're just going to get that out so we can make it nice and fresh. This is quite an interesting one because uh, this molecule occurs in some strange places in nature. One of them being um, in snake venom. So we're kind of using it for the same reason as, as snakes do. Uh, we're going to mix it in the in the dart cocktail so that this molecule pulls these anesthetic drugs from where the dart releases in the muscle into the circulation because we want it to reach the central nervous system as quick as possible so that they go down uh, as, as fast as possible and they don't run for long periods of time. So that's what's going to be in the dart and uh, we'll talk you through the rest of it a little bit later. Just one last thing to add on the mechanics of this. There's a detonator in the back of the dart, so on impact, that shock force of it hitting something and drives a, a plunger forward, hits the detonator, and then that uh, pressure that builds up in the back of the dart will push the rubber bung uh, forward and that pushes the, the dart out the front of the needle. See the needle has tiny little side ports uh, in case the front gets blocked. What we will also do once I finish loading this I'm going to bend the tip of this needle over a little bit because these are pachyderms and the, and the skin where we're darting is, is at least an inch thick, maybe an inch and a half. Uh, so if we leave the, the front of the dart open, skin can go down this shaft and plug it and that stops the drug from being released uh, into the muscle. So just by bending it over slightly we do reduce the chances of, of that complication happening. Okay. Yeah. So this um, hyalase or hyaluronic acid is comes in a powder form, so we just inject some sterile water in here to get it to flush out of the bottle and then uh, suck that up and add that to the cocktail. Okay, that should do it. Okay, fortunately our rhino are playing ball so far and they're giving us the time to do this without being in too much of a hurry. I'm going to make sure we don't overfill. Okay, that looks good. To put the needle over. Just ever so slightly. Maybe a bit more than that. Okay. Right, that looks good to go. The other piece of equipment what we're going to be using is this um, dart gun or dart projector. It's a gas charged uh, machine. Basically compressed CO2 is what pushes it out, so it's like a glorified blowpipe. Nice thing about this, um, this gun is it's slightly quieter than the other one, so normally I'd say we won't spook the rhino too much. Unfortunately there's so many of them 
uh, in this crash, I think we're going to struggle not to spook them. I think they are going to run um, and be quite upset in the first few minutes of this. So hopefully they don't run too far once they realize that, that there's nothing more happening to them. Okay, so I'm ready on the drugs. Um, let me just make sure all these things get out of my way. Then we just need to do a final clean check. We know where everyone is. Colin has come out on cue, which is uh, doesn't always happen. So we'll keep it front, keep us between here and the bush line. Okay, Jason's going to bring us in on a sensible approach line, try and block them from running back to the bush. And then it's just a case of lining up a nice perpendicular shot to a muscle. I'm hoping for a shoulder uh, neck area, but we'll see. If that doesn't work out, we'll go for a rump. Remind me who we're looking at again. Uh, let's do it from the right. So right now I've got surprisingly quick reaction. So we want to get into about 25 meters from here. We're on about 30 at the moment. So we're not in a bad place. Uh, talking about this one second from the... Yeah, it's a no. Okay, so we have Colin, Colin in our sights. He's in a nice position. Let's just check with Joe where she is. We've got him at 22 meters, which is good. closer than what we thought. I'm just going to drop my gas a little bit to adjust for that. Okay, so everything's lining up nicely. Just about ready to take a shot. We're just going to wait for the shoulder to be a little bit more parallel to us. Got a very nice rump shot here, which I'm tempted to take. Okay, I think we're going to change to rump. So, everyone ready? Here we go. Okay, it's going in, going in. Do you keep on moving right now? Okay, so what we have ended up here is just slightly on the wrong side of it. Stopwatch on, Candice. Okay, so now, now the stressful bit starts. Uh, I think turn off, Jason. The nice thing is they moved into a really nice position. Uh, he, Collins has run back to with other crash, members of his crash. I said, that's great. But this is where I get really anxious because we've got about three minutes to see if that dart has um, got into a muscle, make sure it hasn't blocked uh, and make sure no, no bending has happened underneath the skin. And the, and the way we're going to know that in about two to three minutes time is we're looking for first symptoms. So. The critical thing here is this, uh, as the clock starts ticking, is the distance, the, the time frame between dart in and first symptoms. And um, from what I can see at this angle, it looks like the needle sitting very nicely. Can um, we to call ground teams first of all? Um, yeah, well, I think they can come here, yeah. Chris is coming for Jason Chris. What's playing into our favor here is uh, these other rhino are keeping him nice and settled. So he, a few things I need to get ready. One is a uh, intravenous catheter that we're going to be putting into his ear to give us access. Another one is a syringe and needle uh, ready to drop the first sort of partial wake up, which is called butorphanol. Time there, Candice? We're on almost three. Okay, so at the moment I'm not seeing first symptoms. They're a little bit anxious still. And um, there might be something happening. <coughs> Looks like we've got good first symptoms, so that's great news. And um, the rest of the crash are keeping him here in a nice open space, so we're kind of out of the danger 
And I think, uh, Jason, what we can start doing is, is going around that side, yeah. Get closer to him. I'm just going to drop some butorphanol. This will be the first drug we give him. Okay, let's go right around that side, they can get that shot there. putting pressure on them now so we can get these other ones to start moving away but this is a spot drive the others will a little bit come in between the two. okay so Colin's feeling the effect of this drug really badly now he's staggering and swaying and he's just about to fall over I just want to see if we can nudge these guys away without uh, what we don't want here is for this lady to interfere with what we're doing, uh, we do need to get her away from Colin. You can see this bond that they have is, is amazing, how they look after each other. Okay, see if you can slip in here now. Okay, good. Uh, not to be. I'm not sure anything like that. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, alright. Just get out. And go put the blindfold on quickly. Uh, you got blindfold, Candice? Okay, so what we're trying to do here is to just limit the stimulation as, as early as possible. Hope we don't get into any altercations with other runners. Eh? I'm going to put a blindfold over Colin's eyes. Catheter. I'm standing in the colour. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Some earplugs, please. Okay, well, okay. Come on, come on. Come on. Next step is just to put some earplugs into his ears. It also limits the stimulation. It's just about to fall over. I don't want to stand on me. <laughs> Good man. Okay, so at this point, uh, Candice, you can help me with the catheter while I just secure blindfold and get the first drugs in as quick as we can. Because these are immobilization drugs, there is a level of consciousness that uh, animals feel while they're under the effects and by Waking them up a little bit, they also become fairly conscious uh, and hence the need just to try and block any outside stimulation. Okay, they're looking good. Right, so butorphanol is going in. First 20 milligrams. Ready with that? Oh. Okay, that nice and dark. Want me to put another one in? Yeah, maybe just another one on this ear just to be safe. Okay, there we go. There we go, boy. Good boy. Good boy. All right, you can see his black color is already dark. We're going to verify that with the machine as quick as we can. What I'm also going to start doing is giving him a muscle relaxant. The idea behind the muscle relaxant is that when we give him a stronger wake-up drug hopefully he's not going to stand up and uh, and run away from us um, with too much gusto. The that's going in is uh, a sedative, also a very strong muscle relaxant. Interesting thing about this drug 
is in humans it causes profound amnesia. So with any luck it does the same to Rhino too and uh, wipes out all short term memory of this procedure. But we'll see. We'll see uh, one day when we can talk to them in heaven. We'll, we'll ask them if it really worked. Okay, I'm just going to let those drugs take effect. She's going to give another 10 milligrams of butorphanol just because of the how bad the color was to begin with. Okay, so this goes in there. Just checking blood color as we do this. These veins are not getting bored. blood color is already starting to improve which is good we're going to do an arterial sample in a second and see if we can measure that you one of those hmm? okay Candice will you monitor anesthetic tell me what you think 54 54 okay Right, so we're happy so far, anesthetic's going well, we're getting things uh, lightened up a little bit, good. I'm just going to check his blood colour. We've got the ability now, um, through sponsorship of Abaxis, to be able to measure things at the uh, point of care right next to them, which we could never do before. I wish we had this machine when we were treating Tandy eight years ago. Um, it can do a whole bunch of things, but the main reason today why we're using it is to take an arterial sample, measure blood oxygen, blood carbon dioxide and that gives us an idea of how well the respiratory and the cardiovascular system is working. Uh, the tricky part of the rhino is you've got to raise an artery and the arteries sit right inside the ear. So the technique to do that is to rub like crazy until this artery starts to stand up. See it there? It's right inside the ear for some strange reason rubbing it like this helps to expose this artery so we can get a sample and hitting an artery is not as easy as hitting the vein looks like we've got some blood coming back which is good this is a heparinar syringe which means as this blood comes back into the syringe it mixes with an anticoagulant and that anticoagulant keeps the blood from clotting. You ready? And we can start with the rest of things with Colin. Uh, third drug has just gone in and uh, this is the one that really makes them much lighter. So what this one can do is get them to stand on their feet, which is not ideal for everyone around us, but what I like about that is if they do get up, it means that they can get circulation back into these legs and that uh, limits the, the dangers there. What we're looking for with that muscle relaxant is nice wobbly muscles like this. So you can see that drug is starting to kick in nicely. Um, and this gives me an, an internal indicator that the muscle relaxant, muscle relaxant is now working. Okay, so we're happy anesthetically. Things are on track. Uh, We've got the brake rope on. Uh, waiting for some blood tests to come back from the Zoetis machine and we can start with the deawning process as soon as you're done there get me a heart rate Candice okay so what is important here is we take a measurement from the base of the horn from where the keratin starts there and somewhere between eight and ten centimeters is our is our mark so i'm going to start off by marking eight there eight there uh, eight centimeters on the okay, so there's our guideline. Now, just having a profile look at his horn, decide if I think that eight centimeters is going to work. Looking at how wide the base is here, I'm going to go a little bit higher. So, we're actually going to cut closer to nine, and that's going to be Jason's mark for the first cut. The first cut is really important. What we don't want to do here is, is uh, 
cut too close to the sensitive tissues. Okay. My guidelines here. Heart rate 60, so I'm happy with that. I'm going to check his blood color now quickly. There, the back one's a little bit more difficult um, because the measurements are much lower. And we're probably going to have to use a grinder to do most of the, the heavy work here, but we'll just cut the tip off like that and then use a the grinder for the rest. Other thing that's going to help Jason is if we just slide this blindfold around a bit. Okay, who's got stopwatch time there? So the reason why we check blood color so frequently is that this the oxygenation in blood causes blood to be either a nice bright red color which is what we are starting to see now if there's low oxygen then we get a very dark almost black color to blood and that's not good that tells us the tissues are under an enormous strain because they're not getting good oxygen in there so this is getting better not perfect yet as soon as this last drug, the diprenorphine, kicks in, then uh, it should look a little bit better than that. Okay, we're good to dehorn. A lot of people question why we dehorn rhino. It's quite a controversial topic. There are a lot of people that are for it and there are a lot of people that are, are against it. From a Kareka Game Reserve perspective, it was a very easy decision for us. Between 2009 and 2012, we had five animals poached, four died, one survived. And our survivor is Tandi, as you know. Our first um, line of defense at that time was to dehorn our rhino. We didn't have a fully, a fully um, trained or operating anti-poaching unit. We didn't have the funds to get a fully trained and anti-poaching unit on the ground. So dehorning was our immediate call to action to make sure that our rhino were protected and it worked. Since then, in the last eight years, we've made huge strides um, in rhino conservation broadly and we now have a, a multi-layered approach to rhino conservation with dehorning really only as one of the layers to disincentivize poachers. We do run an active, well-trained, well-resourced anti-poaching unit and canine unit. We, we do, however, believe that the only sustainable way to really protect rhino in the future is through education and through changing people's hearts and minds and changing behavior. So with that in mind, we run an environmental education program in our surrounding communities where we teach and inform people. We run a social and emotional learning program, which basically gives inner skills to children to help connect them back to themselves and to connect them to nature. And we run a community conservation intern program where we train community members uh, to, to become um, uh, trained in wildlife protection services so that they are employed and good people get employed back into the system to protect our animals. So dehorning is one thing we do, it's one layer of what we do. We, we don't like doing it, we know it's invasive, but really we will do anything it takes to ensure that our rhino remain protected um, and that no one wants to come onto this reserve and take them. And dehorning is a very, very important part of that process. I want to give you an idea of some of the costs that we are struggling with at the moment. Us and all of our friends and our partners globally to run an active, engaged anti-poaching unit at the moment at reduced rates is £5,000 a month. Under normal circumstances, when we commercially, when we operate in commercially, it's far higher than that. And that is just the running costs of vehicles, of salaries, of feeding, of ammunition, etc., etc. It does not cost. It does not include any veterinary procedures. A basic dehorning costs 250 pounds. A collar is another aspect that needs to be funded. That costs another 250 pounds. Um, it doesn't include any training of APU members, it doesn't include any equipment that our APU members need. It's a very, very basic cost that we need to cover on a monthly basis and other rhino conservation um, organizations globally. So once again, I'm, I'm really pleading um, that you open your hearts, that you dig very deep into your pockets to support the Rapid Response for Rhinos initiative because through them you will be supporting so many of these rhino conservation projects to remain active and rhino protected. Get it under his, his face, please. Open it up, open it up, open it up. Purpose of this is just to catch the filings. Uh, not because they're valuable to us, but because they are valuable to other people. 
and uh, by law we need to submit all of these filings with the horns for permit reasons. Okay, how's it look? Good. Looks good? Okay. Uh, well, let's just whack the sides quickly. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so this part is the grinding bit, which takes a bit of time. Uh, the purpose here is to try and get as much of this keratin off as possible. Looks a little bit mechanical, um, but he, he can't feel anything. We're well away from the sensitive parts of, uh, of his horn here, so looks bad, but he, he's got no feeling here. Okay, so we're finished with the grinding and we've taken off as much keratin as we can safely. The important thing here is we've taken away as much incentive to poach as we can from Colin. Anesthetic is working very nicely. I'm going to call uh, Lindy in now to, to put the collar on. Um, so Lindsay, why don't you come a bit closer. Uh, this is a tracking device that uh, the anti-poaching team use to, uh, to keep tabs on these rhino and spend more time with them. Um, so thanks once again to Helping Rhinos for making a procedure like this possible. Um, this is another rhino that's got a bit more technology uh, attached. I think let's go a little bit tighter. Tighter, a little tighter. Okay, so okay. Lindy's putting uh, the collar on. It's, it's no more difficult than putting a, a collar on your dog or cat. Obviously it mustn't be too loose and mustn't be too tight. A little bit tighter. Mm -hmm. So the looser they are, the more they move around and, and the more they chafe, although it's a very soft chafe. There we go, that should be good. And the tighter they get, the more risk we have of impeding blood circulation. So that is perfect. Is that good? Colin is a particularly special rhino to our family. Um, he's not only Tandy's second calf, but he was, he was born on the 24th of January 2017, four days after my dad, Colin Rashmi, passed away on the uh, 20th of January. There are a few quite beautiful synchronicities about the story. I was actually with Will um, having dinner on the night when I heard that my dad and I got the call to say that he had passed away. Uh, Will and I go way back to school um, and maybe it was a little message from my dad to say that Will and I would have some work to do in the future on behalf of these incredible animals. 
Um, we were all gathered as a family the night before my dad's funeral. It was, it was very synchronistic that I was actually with Will and his wife Heidi having dinner in Grahamstown when I got the call that my dad had passed away. He was 79 years old um, and he had been ill. Um, and it was, it was four days later that the whole family had gathered for his funeral in Port Elizabeth and we, were, we weren't actually aware that Tandy was even pregnant and we got the message that Tandy had had a calf and that it was um, a boy and that we would most certainly name it after my dad. Um, so that is how Colin came to be. Um, yeah, so we go to, to extra lengths to protect every single rhino on this reserve and to play our part to, to help rhino globally because more than anything we want this bull to grow, to sigh many, many offspring um, and to live the longest and, and most happy and peaceful life that he can. So, one of the things we are obliged to do as part of our national efforts to protect rhino is take a set of DNA samples. The other thing we are doing to Colin today is we are ear notching him. And this is a, an identification V that we're going to cut into his ear. Um, which I'm just clamping here so that we can limit the, the bleeding once the cutting starts. We'll just give that a few minutes. So Candace is busy taking uh, blood samples on the other ear here. And those blood samples will go into the central database known as Rhodus. And there are thousands and thousands of rhino samples that have been sent to the Honest Report lab um, to compile a DNA database of the whole country's rhino population. We'll use this skin that comes out here to go into that DNA set. We've got blood coming off there. We're going to take some hairs, probably from the tail, because they're slightly bigger than these hairs on the, on the fringes of the ears. And then we're also going to take some of these horn shavings and put them in the kit um, to go for DNA analysis. So that's the DNA sampling side of it. Okay, so the clamp's been on for a little while. I'm just going to, uh, to cut this piece of skin out. There'll be a little bit of bleeding initially, which will stop quite quickly. We'll see if we can feel it as we're cutting. Just don't want to make this slip. Bending that down, he seems nice and relaxed, does Colin. Okay, chap. Alright. So that little bit of skin goes in with some desiccation granules to dry it out. And that joins the blood, the hair, and the horn shavings. Right, so this is going to go on for a few minutes just to keep the blood clotted and then I'll take that away in, in about five minutes time. So we're going to be giving um, antibiotics and some multivitamins just as a precaution because we don't know if they're sick or not. Um, they can't tell us if they're sick and just to boost their immunity or their systems after darting. So these are going to go in IM, which is intramuscular, in his butt here. <coughs> Draw back just to see that you're not in a vein and inject. That was the first one. Two more antibiotics. In the very early days after Tandi's poaching, we learned in a very humble and tangible way that rhino conservation was a team sport and we simply couldn't carry um, the burden um, to care for these animals on our own. And the international global community has been incredible at raising funds to ensure that these kinds of procedures um, can happen and we support to do them. So specifically for Collins dehorning, um, we'd like to thank Florina and her team from the Durham Towers preschool in Saudi Arabia for raising the funds so that we could do this dehorning and a huge thank you to Tanya and Gerard West from Down Dancing for Rhinos who very very quickly heeded our call and found the funds for the three collars that we needed to proceed with the dehorning today. We're so incredibly grateful to you all. Thank you so much. Okay our procedure on Colin the Rhino at Kruger Game Reserve is done. Um, the dehorning is complete. We've fitted the tracking device. We've done DNA samples. Uh, we've used the Zoetis 
uh, blood machine to check his oxygen levels which have been fantastic all the way through so he's had a great anesthetic uh, it's now time to wake him up just a final uh, word of thanks to all those of you that have joined us online um, doing this rapid response for rhinos initiative by helping rhinos more importantly thank you so much for all the support that you give helping rhinos over the years your support and the care that we feel from abroad is what keeps us going in our fight to save this magnificent species and it's individuals like this that just show us how resilient they can be if we just give them that little bit of, of help along the way so thank you all especially helping runners for um, the amazing work you do here i'm going to wake him up now um, and that involves an intravenous injection of a, a final wake-up drug you can hear him snoring away there let's do a last check of his blood color which looks very really good Sorry about all the blood here, just because of the ear knots that's bleeding slightly. Um, so in this goes, and we just take off his blindfold, remove his earplugs, and we are away. We're going to leave him in, in quiet. Okay, boy. I'm just going to leave this. watching wake up the things we look for now is just that his legs are working he has been lying back on that back right for quite a while so he might have pins and needles there could take him a little while to, to feel his leg um, fully but he's had a great anesthetic his blood oxygen levels have been great thanks uh, for confirmation by that Zoetis machine um, so everything has gone smoothly we just need final confirmation when he wakes up <laughs> so at this stage he's got a bit of tranquilizer in him. Obviously the muscle relaxant, which is a sedative, is still working. This is the best moment for me in my work. Amazing, eh? To see him wake up in this incredible landscape, listen to all the birds around him, those little noises he made was to try and get back into communication with his, the rest of his group. You can see he's got his nose on the ground now, so he's starting to sniff where everyone had been before they moved away. And what he'll now do is he'll start tracking his friends like a bloodhound um, until he finds them. Okay, so this is always the best part of the job, knowing that anesthetic has gone well, um, rhinos are safe they're on their feet, uh, no complications, and we've got the job done thanks to an amazing effort from the team on the ground here. But also don't forget the support of many of you on the other side. So thanks for that. It's, a, it's an exhilarating feeling knowing that we are winning in this part of, of Africa um, so far. Obviously we've got a long way to go. And uh, now more than ever at a time like this we need to pull together. We need to re-establish our connection with the environment. And one of those species that is under enormous pressure because of what we do as humans are these guys. So for today we've done a good thing thank you for all being a part of that we appreciate it very very much
Wow, that was amazing to see such an insight into what goes into uh, such a procedure just that is needed just to ensure that our rhinos are healthy and protected going forward. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, but don't, don't go anywhere yet. We still have plenty more to come with Will and Lindy here live uh, to answer some questions. Uh, before we get to that, though, I just want to bring your attention to um, an online auction that we're running linked to this event. That includes some amazing items that you can bid for, including the opportunity to travel in person when restrictions allow, to be next to Will uh, on, a, on a minor procedure like the one you've just seen. Um, I can only, can only imagine how great that would be to be a part of his team for such a procedure. It also includes the opportunity to be welcomed to Koreka by Lindy herself uh, and to have your own very special personal safari to go and look for Tandy and for Colin. So uh, please do head over to the page in uh, the, the links that you can see on your screen at the moment. Um, you see some of the other items rolling through. We've got some great pieces of jewelry, including uh, a nine carat gold piece by Rhino Tears, lots of original artwork, including a stunning rhino by Darren Baker, uh, who has also painted the Queen and uh, Prince Charles. So you're being very good company if you, uh, if you choose to purchase his, uh, his rhino. Uh, so please do take have a look. The auction is open until 7 p.m. UK time tomorrow. That's Sunday, the 19th of July. Um, so have a look uh, and don't miss out on some great opportunities. And anything that you do bid will all go directly to help protecting rhinos in their natural habitat. Okay, let's get to Will and Lindy, still with us live from South Africa for um, a questions and answer session. So when I say still with us live for a questions and answer session, I have to say it only by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> we, we lost Will a little while ago, but he's, uh, he's made a plan, as, as all good South Africans do, uh, and has found a place to, to reconnect with us and to be part of this live Q&A. So um, let me just say again, um, Will and Lindy, thank you so much for uh, for having the film crew there for sharing that as well. I can see we've had some amazing comments coming through um, on social media um, in terms of what the whole process is. Lots of questions, so we'll, we'll get into those um, very quickly, I think. Um, I mean, just to answer a couple of those, I know some people were asking, shouldn't it be dark if we're live? Um, I, I, in case you missed the beginning, I think we did say that, that we did have to pre-record the actual procedure because it, it, in itself, it takes quite a long time, and we wanted to give you that really immersive um, feeling, and we can't do it in the dark. So uh, so we did that. So the, the live element was caused, we tried to make it as live as we could, and now, now we hear live, really live, from both Will and from Lindy. Um, so, Will, let me, let me start with you. Uh, you. You kind of look like you're, uh, look like you're an, an old hand at this. Um, how many rhino procedures would you say that you have done um, over the course of your career? Yeah, Simon, um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, first of all, as, as you can see there, we never work alone. We've always got uh, a big team of people with us because there are so many responsibilities to take care of. Um, in terms of how many we've done as a team, um, it's difficult to say. Uh, definitely hundreds, probably approaching uh the the first few thousand my guess would be over the last 19 years now uh what i can tell you the ones that we have counted are the crime scenes the rhino poaching scenes that we've been to just my team alone are now numbering 52. um so those are the ones we sort of have to count because of the the legal process that's attached to them um the other ones are just uh, uh, a pleasure that goes by in a blur um, and the only ones we've ever lost actually under anesthetics were, the, were rhino that were severely debilitated and, uh, and we had to put to sleep. So it, we've got a phenomenal record uh, with the species. Um, amazing, Will. Um, I, I think everybody, everybody watching is in, in awe of the work that you do. Um, but, but let me just say, so you mentioned 52 crime scenes. So when, when you talk about a crime scene, um, it, what you mean is uh, a rhino that's been victim of the poachers. Yeah, absolutely, Simon. Um, you know, some of those crime scenes have been rhino, fortunately, mm -hmm. that have survived, Tandy being one of them. Um, but 
most of the time, unfortunately, by the time we get called, uh, we are going to do a post-mortem and to help the forensic units and the investigators uh, in literally uh, gathering evidence from a crime scene about how that animal died and, and if there's anything left behind that can help us link that crime to a criminal one day. So, so Will, what, um, I, I mean, I can only imagine what that must be like from an emotional perspective, but, but you know, when you come across poaching survivors, the likes of Tandy, what, what, what emotions do you go through? I think you know, everyone in that situation is under enormous duress. Um, when we're working with a survivor, though, there's no room for uh, emotions to get in the way of the decisions that have to be made, sometimes very hard decisions on the day. So we just you know, keep our heads down and, and we focus on what we need to do. I can tell you, though, that the, the journey home is a very silent journey and and that's when the emotions come flooding to the surface um, and you know many of us have to suppress all of that uh, over the years and I, and, I, and I speak for probably hundreds, hundreds if not thousands of people in this country who've been in that situation uh, and it does take a toll on people's psychology I've no doubt about that um, I, I've uh, know of many many other colleagues who've seen far worse than I have. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's an awful thing to have to deal with. The counterbalance to that is when we do get the opportunity to work with the healthy ones, even when we're doing procedures we don't like, like a dehorning. Um, it's an exhilarating feeling, literally touching and working with a dinosaur. Um, and that's something that we cherish um, and we would like our children and their children to be able to appreciate um, for many, many generations to come. Uh, so that's why we, we put our heart and souls into this. Again, amazing, amazing Will. Um, I, I can see just coming through social media, everybody's kind of in, in awe of everything that, that you guys go through just to keep these, these safe, um, our rhinos safe. Um, I mean, we did see Tandy kind of as you were driving through the, the valley early on in, in the procedure, and you, you you talked a little bit around when you were treating her. We we saw that obviously she still doesn't have a have a horn, and I we I think a question we get asked quite a lot is, will Tandy's horn ever grow back? So the back horn has grown back, um, thanks to in in part anyway to the skin grafts that were. Uh, put into place by the Saving a Survivors team that was pioneering work back in 2013 and 2014. Uh, her front horn, those skin grafts didn't take, but largely due to the fact that back then we didn't have the technology to to protect her face. Uh, the, the plates that have since been developed by the Saving a Survivor team were only being conceptualized back in, in the days when we worked on Tandy. So she has contributed to uh, medical procedures now that are helping other rhino recover far quicker, um, but it does not look like she will ever regrow her front horn. Um, if she was victim of, of poaching in these days, I believe her face would, uh, would be far less scarred and deformed, but given all she's been through, we are ecstatic as, uh, at how she's turned out, and in a way, you know, she has a beauty um, and is a symbol of something that uh, I would not like to change now just because she represents the tenacity of a species and uh, and the people around her really that have that have done so much to ensure her safety and and so many uh, more thousands of rhino that uh, are enjoying that protection now she's she's definitely um Definitely an amazing rhino. I mean, you can imagine the bravery to, to go through what she did and has inspired so many people to get involved with, with rhino conservation. Um, Lindy, we, we, we saw the dehorning and you talked a little bit about the dehorning that we saw during, during the procedure itself. Um, it, it, you know, we know it's a controversial subject um, and, and we've seen a few comments coming through this evening, obviously saying what a shame it is that we have to go to such drastic measures. Um, so so w w explain a little bit more for us, if you can, around what it is 
um, that make Kareka decide to, to make that decision to dehorn all of their rhino. Hi, Simon. As I as I mentioned in the in the film, um, between 2009 and 2012, Kareka Game Reserve lost five rhino. Uh, well, we had five rhino poached, and four of them we lost, and Tandy survived. Um, and in those days, it was eight years ago or more now, we didn't have um, the resources to, to, to run a fully-fledged um, anti-poaching unit or actually the know-how. Um, you, you know, anti-poaching was, um, was a very new thing back then. So our very first line of defense immediately after Tandy's poaching, because obviously the fact that we had, we had had five poachings in that time period made us realize that geographically we, we were vulnerable and our reserve was accessible to poachers. We took the decision to to dehorn our rhino, and we haven't um, we haven't lost a rhino since 2012. So there are a number of factors that have have played into that. Um, one being that we do now run um, a, a fully fledged, very professional, well trained, and resourced anti poaching unit. But we definitely do believe that dehorning plays a, a very very critical role and disincentivizes poachers. And it's not something. It's not a layer that we feel comfortable enough to let go of as yet. One of the reasons for that is also is that um, we are the, the guardians of Tandi and her offspring. And Tandi is a, is a very high profile famous rhino and her story is a very powerful story. Um, and we made the decision a long time ago that we needed to use Tandi and her story for the bigger purpose of rhino conservation globally. And so we do. And that means that um, Tandi and her, her calves are often in the media, they're often on social platforms, and we have numerous film crews that come through Kareka Game Reserve. Um, and that definitely, um, I think, ups their exposure and possibly their risk, and dehorning mitigates that risk. So although we don't like doing it, um, and although we hope we don't have to do it forever, right now with the status quo of um, of the threat of poaching, it's it's not something we're prepared to compromise on. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, and I think from a security point of view, you know, we've had a question comes in. It says, "How how do you let the world know that your rhinos on Kareka are dehorned?" <laughs> So we do um, we do choose to verbalize that and and show the world very clearly. Uh, we've got a very active uh, media team at Karika Game Reserve. Um, every time we do a dehorning or a series of dehornings, we film them, we put them on our social platforms, we tell people what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and we advertise and we speak about it um, loudly and with conviction, so that people. Um, so that people know that we we do horn and that it's a practice that we do regularly and that we committed to it. Wow, that was amazing to see such an insight into what goes into uh, such a procedure just that is needed just to ensure that our rhinos are healthy and protected going forward. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, um, but don't don't go anywhere yet. We still have plenty more to come with Will and Lindy here live uh, to answer some questions. Uh, before we get... Sorry, Simon, I might have missed that question. Just, uh, why don't you say it again? Yeah, sure. Will, can you hear me? I've got you back, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so a few couple of questions we've had in a few times um, has said, what, how long does it take for the horn to to grow back once it's been dehorned? And obviously that means you, you'll have to repeat that dehorning process. Um, and and what do you do with the horns that once they've been removed? Yeah, the, the regrowth takes approximately two inches a year, more or less, um, of growth, depending on their age. Um, those horns are the property and the responsibility of the reserve on which those rhino live, be it state or private. Um, and unfortunately, they are a massive liability uh, because you know people will will do everything they can, uh, the criminals will anyway, to get those horns off you. So they've got to be uh, stowed away um, somewhere where, where very few people know about them. Um, but yeah, the 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 dehorning process is just one thing. The security of those horns is a whole other uh, responsibility that's got to be um, thought about prior to every procedure. 
Wow, that was amazing to see such an insight into what goes into uh, such a procedure just that is needed just to ensure that our rhinos are healthy and protected going forward. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, but don't, don't go anywhere yet. We still have plenty more to come with Will and Lindy here. Okay, was that one for me, Simon? Sorry, I just lost you for a second. Yeah. Well, yeah. So yes, Will. What I was what I was saying was, have you how ha, um, what what age are the rhinos when you start to carry out? You can first do it the first dehorning, uh, and then the sort of the follow on question we had is, have you seen? I guess from a as in, in a veterinary perspective any changes in either health or behavior in rhinos that have been dehorned? We, we don't like to work on them before they are about two years old, uh, partly because the, the horn is very small anyway, um, and then also because of, of the higher risk when they are that age. So any time from two to two and a half years onwards, uh, we start that dehorning process. Um, the question of dehorning uh, a rhino really is something that every reserve has to consider, not just from a security point of view, but also the social dynamics of those rhino. Uh, we always advise that if you're going to dehorn, you must try and take all the horns off and not leave any animals with horns on because it gives them an unfair advantage against each other because they, they do use their faces socially quite a lot in, uh, in engaging with each other. Um, so where we've taken all the horns off, we have not seen any uh, negative behavior or, or things that put those animals at risk. I would say, though, that if there were large prides of lions uh, in those areas, uh, particularly uh, big cats that had learnt you know, how to uh, target rhino, there, there may be problems at the young ages where mothers don't have those horns to protect those rhino, but in the situations that I've been involved in, we have yet to find an example where a dehorned rhino has not been able to protect her calf uh, from predators and other rhino. Okay, great. And, and I guess that time will tell a little bit, you know, we'll continue to monitor that, monitor that uh, over, over a period of time. Um, Okay, so I, I guess we'll looking at the the procedure that you you carried out um, on Colin and obviously on, on and have done on a number of other rhinos. Um, it, it looked fairly invasive with the the sort of ear notching and you know and how long the rhino was down for. Do you have any sense if the rhinos have any feeling? They feel anything of the procedure that you're going through? So just on the dehorning side, we, we do take a lot of care in making sure that we cut them at the right level. So we do not uh, touch the sensitive tissues of the horn uh, growth plate. Uh, and that's something obviously that has been developed over years, um, possibly initially through a bit of research and then some trial and error. So I've no doubt in the past we might have got a bit close, but these days we, we're getting better and better at at removing their horn at the right level, and I don't believe that they have any uh, sensation other than the, the vibration of, of those tools working on their faces. Uh, when you look at a procedure, often it, it comes across quite harsh. Um, I challenge any of you to try and record your own operations if you go to hospital, and you'll see there's a, there's a lot that needs to happen, and so we do need to get the job done as quickly as possible, limit the anesthetic time. Um, so, for example, where, where there's a bit of bleeding in the ear notch, like you saw today, uh, we just let that go because we know it's going to clot. And it's these are huge animals, and they've they've got lots of blood to spare. Um, so it's it's you're working in the field; nothing is sterile, um, and it is a bit rough and ready. But uh, through time and and many hundreds of procedures, uh, we believe that the way we do it is. Uh, the best possible timing and uh, and sequence of events uh, to get the job done uh, as quickly as possible and to get them waking up so that we limit any possible side effects. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, Lindy, a, a question for you um, has come in as well, asking how difficult is it to get the local communities engaged and on board 
um, with everything that, that that you're trying to do from a wildlife conservation perspective? Simon, that's a very, very important part of our conservation strategy. We, we believe that um, that education, uh, conservation education, and bringing, inviting our, our communities into the conservation um, space with us is critical to the sustainable survival of the species. So we spend a lot of time and resource and energy um, on a number of community projects um, where we um, connect the community with nature, with knowledge um, and with internal skills that's, that helps them uh, to make responsible decisions. So we run an environmental education program in all of the junior schools and um, high schools around us. We have an environmental team that goes in every week and exposes them actually to such a depth of, um, of, um, of knowledge and interesting topics across the spectrum um, from, from air pollution to ocean pollution to um, uh, biodiversity to, to soil health to so many things. They expose them to video content, to um, TED Talks, um, and the, the kids in the communities have just absolutely loved this whole process to the extent that some of the schools have started their own envir environmental clubs. Um, and so we're actually growing the project next year to formalize those environmental clubs across the three communities and run a, a more in-depth and connected experience for them um, in and around the reserve. Then we also run a social emotional learning program in the schools, and this is to teach the skills of self-awareness and self-management and responsible decision-making. Um, we run a sports program, and every single year we, we enter 300 of our sports kids into the Rhino Run along the Kenton Beach. And anyone who's done the Rhino Run in the last two or three years will say, without a doubt, having those 300 kids singing and dancing with their placards of Tundi, um, with their messages, calling people to action to protect um, the species is, is just very, very uplifting. Um, and then finally, we also run a, a community conservation internship program. We currently have eight community conservation interns, six women and two men. Um, they're actually uh, funded through the YES initiative, which is a national initiative in South Africa. Um, so their, their internship stipend is funded through YES, and we fund all of their training across the year and, and obviously give them some incredible internship experience. So by the end of that year, they are fully employable um, in the wildlife protection services. And we see that as a, as a huge benefit for not only our whole area in the Eastern Cape, but actually for South Africa at large. Brilliant, Lindy. It's um, yeah, it's it's great work. Having been there and experienced the the, the community work that that you're doing, um, it, it's it's very inspiring to see so many of the of the local people starting to to get engaged and have an understanding about what wildlife conservation mm -hmm. is. Um, I, I know the other piece that obviously the the Kareka Foundation is responsible for is is anti poaching. Um, do you get any government support uh, when it comes to running the anti poaching units? No, no. Private game reserves are 100% on their own um, in running anti-poaching units in training and um, resourcing anti-poaching units. It's a very, very big responsibility and it's um, very resource and funding intensive. And it is a, a, a big, um, it's a big burden for, for all of us um, that are, are private game reserve owners. Uh, we are so grateful, though, for the incredible um, relationships we have with the likes of Helping Rhinos, um, Rhino Tears, I'm Wearing My Rhino Tear, Dancing for Rhino, Global Conservation for so many organizations globally who support us with, um, with equipment, with resources, with training, with gear for our anti-poaching units. So a lot of that gets funded externally, uh, but the actual day-to-day -day running costs of our anti-poaching units and our canine units, um, we have to carry and, and we work hard to do that. Okay. It's a great, great job as well, Lindy. Obviously, it's vitally important. And as we, we spoke about before, you know, it's th those, those anti-poaching patrols are, are under threat now because of the, the lack of income coming in. So it's obviously vital that, that we keep those going. Um, Will, another, another question is coming linked to the, the DNA samples that, you, that we saw you take from Colin. Uh, what, what happens to those DNA samples and, and more specifically, um, you know, what is it used for going forward? 
Yeah, Simon, so the samples that we take uh, go to a system that we call RODIS, which is a DNA lab based at the veterinary school up in Pretoria. And it's about collecting as much DNA uh, fingerprints of uh, every single rhino in this country as we possibly can. Because when it comes to the identification of body parts, um, which could have come off a live animal in the case of you know, a, a dehorned uh, piece that's been stolen or got into the illegal trade, um, or heaven forbid, in the case of a dead animal, then DNA is the gold standard. Um, the microchips that we use, the other forms of identification, uh, sometimes fail uh, or, or they they just grow out of the horns or do something that, that doesn't give them that longevity that DNA does. So DNA is a, a critical piece of technology and it has helped us in numerous cases to arrest and convict poachers. So it's uh, a very important part of the procedure. Great, thanks Will. I, I, I was going to start wrapping it up now, um, but we still have a few hundred people watching across across the channels and questions are still coming in. So if you're okay, I'll just ask a couple more. Um, one coming in here says, have you had any experience, Will, of the rhino ever being allergic to the medications that you use? So in my recollection, not with rhino, uh, personally, I have heard of, of some reactions from other colleagues, but it certainly is possible. Uh, we've, we've, we've seen that uh, with other species, um, sometimes fatally so. Uh, so that can be a problem. But um, yeah, one of our, our biggest issues with rhino is we know so little about them still. And many of the drugs that we use on them have, have never actually been through the full gambit of research that that we normally have to do before we use them on a horse or a cow or a sheep or a pig. So we extrapolate a lot of the medication from those domestic species and we we use them on wild species um, and, and we start by, by just guesstimating and, uh, and then hope for the best from there and, and then it becomes a trial and error thing. So it's not an exact science yet. Okay, Thank, thanks Will. Um, so one last question, which I will will ask to both of you, um, and uh, Will, if I if I start with you, and then Lindy, I'll I'll f finish with you. We we talked a little bit around COVID um, earlier on, and I have to say it's been nice to have a relatively COVID-free hour and a half. Um, but but it is, uh, as we said, having massive implications on wildlife conservation as a whole. Um, so how you know can you give us a little bit of an idea, sort of what those implications are? you know, even in the short term for, for you guys on the ground uh, and, uh, you know, how you think that the international community can can help to play a part while uh, while it can't travel to South Africa and, and, and sort of be with you on the ground. Yeah, these are, are absolutely devastating times for conservation across the whole of the African continent and I'm sure other parts of the world too. Um, in terms of, of rhino protection, uh, which is an, just one example. Um, by far and large, the most amount of finance comes from tourism. So as much as we appreciate and, and always have the help of helping rhinos and other nonprofits, the bulk of what pays for protection on these reserves is uh, has been uh, from tourism. And that has now been reduced to zero. Since the 26th of March, we have had zero income from tourism, and that that is now having a, a huge knock-on effect all the way through the system. Uh, it's putting us in a huge strain. It means that we are now more uh, reliant on the help of people like yourselves and and other nonprofits and corporates that have got involved. Medivet just being one of them. Um, the other thing which we're finding really difficult is we've lost that sense of connectivity with the outside world because people can't travel. They can't come here and appreciate these animals in the flesh. And, and as much as we, we're trying to do something tonight, you know, virtually through um, media, nothing beats being here in, in the live and present flesh. And, and that is, uh, you know, I know something that uh, uh, we're worried about because that connection is such an important part of this human relationship to the, to the whole planet that I believe is also you know, a symptom of why we're in, in the trouble that we're in with COVID. Uh, we have to find ways to connect 
So in the short term, while travel is restricted, all I can encourage uh, viewers online and, and, and your respective networks to do is to try and keep the connection going, even though you can't be here. Uh, and, and we'll obviously try our best to keep sharing what we do on the ground, um, because without that, uh, you know, the, the interest starts to wane and uh, and we, we really don't know how we're going to get through the next six to 12 months here. So just to expand on the first point that Will made, the um, sustainable ecotourism model um, works because of the interaction between commerce through tourism and then that being reinvested back into community and conservation initiatives. Um, and we have we have lost the whole commercial tourism arm of that um, of that in interdependence between the three things. So in the case of the Kareka Foundation, um, we 80% or maybe even 90% of our funding comes through a conservation and community levy that is paid by our guests for every night that they spend there. And that money comes into the Kareka Foundation Trust and we then direct the investment into conservation and into community. Uh, and part of that is running our anti-poaching unit. And that has gone from, um, that has gone to zero, as Will said. So all of that, all of those funds that are critical to running our anti-poaching unit, to um, keeping the threads of our community projects going, that money now has to be raised by ourselves. Um, we do not have any commercial support to do that. The responsibility is squarely on our shoulders. At the same time, uh, there is a, a, a human crisis unfolding on our doorstep, and, and, and we are only at the very, very beginning of that crisis. But at the end of this month, um, our neighbours, and they're probably 3,000 families that live in three communities at that border Kareka Game Reserve, um, they, will, they will have zero income coming in. We've come to the end of the TERS UIF uh, benefits that the government instituted at the beginning of lockdown, um, and, and private reserves have had no income for a number of months, and it's impossible to maintain salaries. Retrenchments have just started, um, and that's only the beginning. It's going to take us years to get tourism back to pre-COVID levels, and that means that those families are going to be in need um, for years, and the human crisis is going to deepen and worsen. And as the human crisis deepens and worsens, so that um, extends to an animal crisis. And um, we do believe that there will be a far greater threat uh, to, to, to wildlife poaching and to poaching of rhino and bigger game as, as poverty and hunger worsens. So the good side is um, where we sit in South Africa, we have a very weak rand. Um, and many of the people who are listening tonight um, have pounds and dollars that translate into, that go, well, that go a very, very long way in South Africa. So like Will said, um, please stay connected to us. We are so incredibly um, grateful for any support you can offer. Um, we are using all our creativity to approach the situation with optimism, with, with creativity, with, with um, positivity, um, to protect the animals and to help the, the people and our friends and our neighbors through this um, very devastating time. And, and you are a really, really important um, piece of the puzzle for us. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, I hope that one of you bid on those auction prizes to come and visit Will and me in South Africa as soon as the lockdown um, is lifted. We are missing our guests and we're missing the, the freedom with which we were able to, to do our jobs before COVID-19. And we're going to work really hard to try and get, to get everything going and to as I said before, keep our animals safe and help our friends and neighbours. And we need your help. Lindy, thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to I'm going to start to wrap wrap things up. Um, let me just say to both Will and Lindy, thank you so much for for being with us this evening. Um, thank you even more for everything that you do every day in keeping the rhinos safe. Um, and obviously, a big thank you to having the film crew out while you did the procedure on, on Colin. And I, I really do believe it's a fantastic, uh, it's been a fantastic opportunity for people to, to keep engaged, as you both were just saying, you know, that's critical from, from your perspective to keep people around the world engaged. And, and I really hope that we've been able to do that this evening um, by creating such a, you know, an immersive rhino experience and help, really helping people to understand what it is um, that, that you guys go through when you when you have to undertake such a 
such a, 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 a procedure. So, so thank you very much. Um, I think if we were if we were on stage in London as we were supposed to be, there'd be a massive round of applause now. So maybe we just imagine that happening, as I'm sure people are watching online from from all around the world. Um, and I'm sure we'll all speak to you um, soon. Uh, speak to you again very very soon. Let me just um, just say uh, again a big thank you to everybody here who's um, who's has been watching online, who's still watching online now. Um, there's a number of people that uh, that made tonight possible, and in, in just a moment we'll just recognise who those people were. Um, and please do just stay tuned for just three or four more minutes, just to see what it is you can bid for in terms of the safari. Uh, with Will um, and including a procedure like you've seen tonight and the safari with uh, with Lindy on Kareka. Um, it's an amazing starting price. I mean, for six people to go to, to Kareka um, for, for such a, a, what could be a, an absolute steal um, and you'll have your own your own safari to go and find Tandy and, and see Colin uh, as well. So uh, please do keep supporting us. Uh, as we've said many times tonight, we need you more than ever now. Um, so uh, thank you so much for uh, for giving up your early Saturday evening, your Saturday morning, your Saturday lunchtime, where, where, whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, we really appreciate it. Keep following us on social media. Um, keep keep going to to our websites um, for all the latest news, and we will see you again very soon. The African Rhino Conservation Collaboration invites you on an exclusive trip to the Eastern Cape of South Africa where you will stay at one of the 11 lodges and go on a safari on the award-winning Amakala Game Reserve. You will be invited behind the scenes at the Ark and you will be hosted by the world famous wildlife vet Dr. William Folds, who will teach you about the rhino and their poaching plight. You will then be taken to meet an anti poaching unit and you will be introduced to Ella, the Eastern Cape's first cold scent tracking dog, as well as being educated about the role of fixed wing aerial patrols. You will also be taken to some of ARC's community projects, which develop socio-economic conservation solutions, as well as to educate the next generation. And the grand finale, you'll be taken on a once-in-a-lifetime experience, joining Dr. Folds on a rhino procedure, where you'll be up close and personal with these amazing animals. I'm here with Peter, Gary, Sonia and Margaret You will then Singapore. get a chance to fly inside the chopper where you will watch the rhino recover and get an aerial perspective of the reserve before carrying on with your amazing safari.
my guest at Karika Game Reserve. I would love nothing more than welcoming you to Karika Game Reserve. Rhinos is putting on a trek up Africa's second highest mountain and we still have some places left for you to join us. You'll spend a week trekking up the beautiful Mount Kenya and you'll also get to spend two nights on Old Pejeta Conservancy and see how your trek will actually be making a difference on the ground to make a better future for rhinos. Rhinos.org to find all the details of our trek and how you can sign up. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.